good. Movable type. Um, such that you can, you know, as opposed to a wood carving, which you can use to print something over and over again. Movable type is distinct from that, and that movable type allows you to change what it is you want to print. And so the invention of movable type in the late 15th century changed the world dramatically. Um, one thing it did was it allowed people to print the Bible, which prior to that time had been copied by hand. Of course, you can also print any book you want to. And so this was the beginning of the precursors to modern publishing, which just, I mean, in a lot of ways it brought on the Renaissance, this ability to transmit knowledge in a much more expedient way. Um, hey, Pavan, get that door for me, would you? Thanks. Prior to that time, there was, um, there was a, uh, if you want to make copies of a text, and I'm primarily thinking about religious texts, you had to copy them by hand. And that was the case for thousands of years prior to the late 15th century, just before the beginning of the Renaissance period. Um, and this was a whole, it was, a whole, it was like a career. Um, amongst Christians, the um, they would have monks and monastics in monasteries, and they would spend their life copying the Bible. And the spread of Christianity throughout the known world is really a singular event. It's 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 never happened before. Um, never happened since. Basically, half the world's population is Christian. This small, obscure schism off of a very, very small religious group of Jewish people ended up taking over the world and proliferating all over the world many times over. It's, um, it's like the best marketing campaign that the world's ever known. And there was a whole career arc that monastics would have in monasteries. They would copy the Bible. You might order half a dozen Bibles for some work you were doing in India. Or in China, and it might take 10 years. It might take 20 years to copy the texts. And they would also make line drawings, beautiful line drawings. You look at old manuscripts, there's beautiful line drawings made as part of the Bible. So not like the full-color portraits you see nowadays, but they would draw along with their writing. And you know, relatively simplistic art compared to modern standards, but it was, you know, the, the scribes were able to um, uh, demonstrate and, and, and show off their um, artistic prowess and their skill as artistes and not just as merely as scribes. And so you see that was also quite common. Um, the Jewish tradition is, I mean, there were literally hundreds of rules, thousands of rules even, for how to copy the Hebrew Bible, um, the type of animal skin it was on, how it was bound, uh, how many lines per page, how many letters per line. It was extremely rigorous art. And they had also, it wasn't the monastics who did it, but they had a professional class, the Soferim, the sophers, the, um, the scribes, and that was what they also did for a living. And even today, you can, you can uh, commission, for, you know, for a very, very large amount of money, you can commission a uh, uh, 
a Hebrew Bible to be copied, which is then used in a synagogue. They're only allowed to be used in synagogues, and they still follow the same standards they follow now. And it's it's also, there's a whole Six Sigma thing. I don't know how familiar you guys are with manufacturing, but if you have six people look at something um, as part of a process of manufacturing, you get down to three mistakes per million. And when you look at the hundreds of manuscripts that, that have been, you know, over the last thousands of years they've discovered, there are remarkably few mistakes because it was such a science, it was such a rigorous skill, and they, the, the, the people who did this took so much pride in their work, it was religious. And so they, practically speaking, didn't make mistakes. Um, It gets even more difficult when you look at Indian texts, which were written on bark, various types of parchment. Um, they were usually engraved with a stylus, carved into the parchment, which just automatically meant you only had a few hundred years because paper degrades over time and so there's no, you know, you're, you're not going to get thousand year old parchment text. They disintegrate somewhere between 100, 200, maybe up to 800, 900 years, but they, they begin to deteriorate tremendously and that's even nowadays when you can put them into a vacuum environment and seal them and, and, and use all sorts of modern methodologies to protect them. Um, But back in the day, with the, the wet season in India and, and, and uh, um, there being no way to, you know, create dust-free environments and microbe-free environments and things like that, they would just disintegrate within a few hundred years. And it's the same thing. We, when we read in our sacred text, we read about people commissioning a book to be copied and it taking time and them having to wait for that book to be copied or looking for a book. Even as recently as the time of Bhakti Vinod Thakur, one of our teachers from just a century and a half ago, a century, you know, yeah, about a century and a half ago, he was looking for a copy of certain sacred texts, the Bhagavatam, uh, for instance, and he was unable to find them. It was difficult to find them. Um, because in times of famine and in times of recession and, and, and depression, then the arts inevitably suffer. And this, this would be in that realm, it would be an art. It's a, it's a luxury item that you do when you're not busy putting food on your table. <clears throat> so, um, this was all just a, a long-winded way of trying to communicate um, just how difficult it was to come into possession of a sacred text, to reproduce a sacred text, to have a library of sacred texts, and how much effort was put into um, creating those libraries, creating those texts, and then perpetually recreating them as they disintegrated on you generation after generation. This makes it all the more remarkable when you look at the sheer number of sacred texts which were memorized and then quoted by our lineage over hundreds and thousands of years because they weren't able to Google things, they weren't able to copy and paste they, they had to go somewhere and sit with a book and read it and then memorize it and then recall it. And this is, there's a whole Sanskrit effect, mnemonic devices which are used from the time of ancient India to pass on sacred texts along with their intonation and proper pronunciation from generation to generation. You can look at groups like the Vaikanasas that never wrote their text down in South India and it's an example of a tonal tradition, a, a tradition of intonation, which was passed down over the course of thousands of years 
from father to son. It was a patriarchal system passed down from father to son, and you can still find iconists today that can chant their recension of the Veda that they were passed down and has been passed down for you're talking about you know, 100, 200 generations. They can also name their forefathers a hundred generations back. Fifty is quite common, a hundred be a little more rare. They can name their generations of forefathers going back fifty, a hundred generations because they, took, they take this stuff really seriously. And there's no written record that they were pulling from, therefore it must be passed down from father to son. And that's how we know what the Veda sounded like, what the chanda of the original Veda sounded like, because it was passed down the living tradition from parent to child. Um, Anyway, I'm going to get back to this. I'm going to sort of tangent off a little bit and then hopefully bring it back together. About five centuries ago, um, in a seaside town called Jagannath Puri, on the eastern seaboard of India, there was a group of spiritual savants that lived and practiced and flourished and created a lineage. That is our lineage. Now, we're Hindu, and so that means that we ultimately trace our tradition back to the Shruti literature, specifically the Upanishads. Generally speaking, I mean, we do use, I was just chanting verses from the Rig Veda today because I was doing a wedding. We have verses from the original Sanghitas that we chant during our ritual process. But philosophically speaking, our tradition really traces back to the Upanishads, um, which are also part of that old Shruti literature. And um, so if we want to get into some sort of serious philosophical debate, we would show the corollary precursor text in the Upanishads and sometimes even going back to the original Sanghitas themselves, the oldest Sanskrit books in the world, to demonstrate our tradition's adherence to and how our tradition followed. In fact, that's what's done. When you want to have a really heavy debate, you have to go back to the original parent text and you have to show how your ritual and your philosophy and your tradition derives from those original books. Did you guys follow that? We, we demonstrate that because we take our textual tradition seriously. We consider it to be revelation and therefore it, we need to ground our teachings in the teachings of our predecessors and in fact it's the mark of a pundit that he's able to do so. The mark of a learned person on tradition they're able to do so. However, although that is true, it's also equally true that our tradition um, is a revival movement. And revival movements are at some point in time a group of people gets together. Normally we're familiar with Christian revivalism and um, to some extent the, I don't know, normalizing of shamanic practices that came over with the slaves from Africa into Christian theology and practice and being slain in the spirit, the laying of hands, speaking of tongues, things like that, that were very much a part of the shamanic traditions that came over with slaves and then became incorporated into Christianity as the slaves converted to Christianity but brought some of their original traditions with them. And you have Santeria, and there's different versions of this, but so much of uh, evangelical Christianity Pentecostal, holy roller type stuff, you can trace almost just directly back to Africa, the exact same practices are there in Africa. So there's a Christian revival movement in the 1800s, but revivalism in general goes back much further than that. And it's when a group of people get together and they say, hey, you lost the plot. There was something special that our people were doing. And then you butchered it or you severed it from its core and your ritual became ritualistic and your doctrine became doctrinaire and in your process of trying to codify everything and keep it together you lost some of the je ne sais quoi, some of the essence that was what the original savants were 
after. Do you guys follow that? And so then a revival movement kicks in. And they say, let's get back to the basics. You get a version of this if you look at uh, Christianity. Jesus in the New Testament says in the book of Matthew that my father had ten commandments, but I only have two. So there were ten in the, books of, in the book of Exodus. But then Jesus distilled them down to two. The essence, the creme de la creme, the core of what the tradition was originally trying to teach. And he said stuff like, you've turned my father's home into a den of thieves as he turned over the money changers' stalls who were selling. You actually get the money changers. It's still existing in India. You go and you'll, you'll take... Um, actually, I don't know what it's like now. I know it's like when I was a kid. Uh, you go to a temple and you give a one rupee coin outside the temple there will be a guy and you'll give him a one rupee coin and then he gives you back nine ten paisa coins so he keeps ten paisa for the service of having changed your money and then you can throw small donations in the temple because you don't want to give him a whole rupee so you break it down and that's probably more like hundred rupee notes now is what people are doing but when I was a kid living in India it was one rupee coins nine ten paisa coins and then you would give those a donation um, so they had money changers who were doing business outside the synagogue. They also selling sparrows because the Jews were into killing animals and you had to sacrifice an animal to the deity and that's how you got blessings because you want to give the greatest thing. So what do you give? You give life. How do you give life? You kill an animal. That, that's where animal sacrifice comes from. The desire of like, what do you give the guy who has everything? Oh, you give him your life. And so then how do you give a life? Well, you're not going to you know, kill yourself, although that is actually what Jesus did. And so the, the, the entire sacrificial motif of the Jewish tradition was repeated in Christianity and it became, went from being an animal sacrifice to being a human sacrifice and that is Christianity. It's the uh, recreation of the Jewish sacrificial cult of animals but it's a human sacrifice and it's for the ultimate extirpation of sins not just the sins of one person or a family or a community but of the whole world for all time. And that's the redemption of Christ and how it's envisioned. And he was crucified like him. He is literally called the Lamb of God because he became the sacrificial lamb. So anyway, they would, you couldn't afford like a whole lamb. You're just going maybe because you, you, know, you cheated somebody or something. You can't afford a whole lamb. So then you buy a sparrow and you kill the sparrow. And that's how you... And so Jesus threw them out and he also threw out the money change. He said, you've turned my father's home into a den of thieves. He was talking about the degradation of this tradition into mere ritual without the driving force behind the ritual. That's a traditional revival movement. And of course, if it's successful for the people who believe that revival movement is good, it's, they've revived the original tradition. The golden age has been brought back. And then for people who don't believe in the revival movement, it's a schism or it's heterodox or apostates or whatever it might be depending on your language that you use in your tradition to designate those people who've gone off the rails. So we, our tradition, the Hare Krishna movement, traces our teachings and our lineage back to the original Vedic literature and we can do so in a sustainable and serious way and in fact, we do that when we debate with pundits who are learned in our Sanskrit tradition and can quote legitimately from the Indic tr tradition and then we can, we can get into an actual, like the rules are set up, have been set up for thousands of years for polemics and we can get into a debate and demonstrate the legitimacy and the authenticness of our tradition to people who are learned to be able to appreciate that we can do that. Simultaneously, we are a revival movement five centuries ago in this seaside town, which is located in India, roughly around where Virginia Beach is located in the U.S., mid-eastern seaboard, seaside town, beautiful seaside town, um, which is actually a tourist spot. People go to Jagannath Puri for tourism now. Kind of like Goa, but not quite as sensual, but not entirely different. Um, there was a group of savants who settled there and practiced there because it was a city which was centered around a temple of Krishna, 
the Juggernaut Temple, and they live there and practice there, and our whole tradition is so deeply embedded in that flourishing revivalist community from five centuries ago that to really appreciate the Hare Krishna movement, you have to know this. And that's why we have Juggernaut on our altar. And that's why we do Ratiatra celebrations. Um, And they had these just impossibly beautiful ideas about the nature of God and the soul and the purpose of human life. and The limitless possibilities of a soul for embracing, literally, the divine and dancing with God and living a life where every word was a song and every step was a dance. They had this just remarkably beautiful, poetic, amazingly deep, profound, well-articulated, brilliant, revelatory ideas about the equality of all souls, breaking down the caste system, equal rights for women, a romantic relationship with divinity, loving God as a child so you don't get wrapped up in what have you done for me lately, but your love just pours forth like a river naturally, flowing without asking for anything in return. That God was available for the price of song. You simply call out God's name. You don't even chant a mantra and ask for anything. You just cry out God's name. And that's sufficient. That receptivity and that grace that automatically ensues. That God was both all good as well as all knowing as well as all powerful. And was available for the price of song. Because any deity who wasn't available and in love with his devotees and capable of fully embracing his devotees and breaking down the barrier between the material and spiritual world and giving emancipation and then some and didn't want to do that would be a defective deity. And so they, they, they came up with this beautiful notion about divinity and also this beautiful notion about the type of practice which, which uh, um, had value and was worth pursuing by the faithful. However, um, I want to jump back to where we were a minute ago. So I gave you two pieces so far. We've got two pieces going. Piece number one is how difficult it is to copy religious texts. How especially difficult it was prior to the beginning of the 16th century. How the entire Renaissance period was the result of movable type. How prior to that, people would spend decades copying a book like the Bible. How that's still done nowadays, and it is, was the career for thousands and thousands of priests over thousands and thousands of years, and it was responsible for the spread of Christianity all over the world. Um, and now I want to look at or we did look at this beautiful community of savants which flourished five centuries ago created a revival movement of Hinduism that simplified things and made them easy and came up with a bunch of really beautiful notions about the nature of God as well as the nature of self the world and, and how to best connect with God but when our and at this point, the train's left the station. I'm going to start to put these ideas together. So please, let's listen carefully from this point forward. I think you guys are all pretty sharp, so I'm pretty sure you could be half listening up till now and have followed everything. I'm also quite repetitive, anticipating that you guys space out. But at this point, I'm going to start to put these ideas together and we're going to walk and chew gum. So please, let's listen carefully now. When our tradition was coming up with their beautiful idea about the nature of God, they weren't operating in a vacuum, just creating something from nothing. Rather, they were deeply immersed in and respectful of and faithful to the precursor tradition. Again, we're Hindus. We're the longest continually practiced, the oldest continually practiced religion on the planet. And fair enough, Gobliki Tepe seems to predate the Indus Valley civilization. It seems like it was a religious structure. There was perhaps religion from the very, very beginning, even before the Vedic cult. No problem. We're cool with that. However, the oldest continually practiced religion in the world, 
no one disagrees, is Hinduism. And why is that? Because the people cared what their predecessors said and kept it alive by passing it on from parent to, 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 to child, from teacher to student. They wrote it down, they copied it down, they preserved it, and, and literally gave their lives to keep a tradition alive. And then practiced it, so it wasn't just a bunch of old texts that nobody understood, but rather it was a living tradition where you learned exactly what was done, how it was pronounced, how the rituals were done, what the philosophy was, because somebody bothered to keep it alive and pass it on and keep it alive and pass it on and keep it alive and pass it on. Keeping it alive means practicing it and realizing it yourself and be getting a black belt, a functional black belt, not just a theoretical one. So as they were reviving things, they didn't just invent stuff and Sanskritize it, like is done with much yoga nowadays, where they give something a fancy, fancy Sanskrit name, and even if it's only 100 years old, they claim it's very, very old. Like, for instance, Surya Namaskar, maybe the most popular pose in the world. Surya Namaskar was invented in 1908. Came from Indian wrestling. It's the Dundan Beta. It's the Hindu version of a burpee. We've got the manuscript. It was the Maharaj of Aund who invented Surya Namaskar. But because it's called Surya Namaskar, people think it's thousands of years old because it went through a process called Sanskritization where you give something an old name and everybody forgets that it's new. And they just think it's really, really old. A couple generations pass and pretty soon it's like, oh, it's as old as time. Um, so our tradition when it was reviving things, it didn't just invent stuff and give it a fancy name. They went back and they read myriad Vedic texts and memorized them, often spending their whole lives traveling on pilgrimage to sacred places so that they could encounter sacred texts, memorize them, digest them, distill them, understand them, and piece them together into an understanding of the entirety of the tradition. And they came up with rigorous definitions of bhakti. And when you look at their definitions, and this is mainly for just insiders, but if you look at a definition like Anya Abhilasita Shunyam, the definition given by Rupa Goswami in the Bhakti Rasamrit Sindhu, you will find that it mirrors almost exactly the structure of Sarvopadi Vinir Muktam from the Pancharatra tradition. And so you'll see that even our nouveau definitions follow very, very carefully the formulaic structure of the preceding tradition and are built on that solid foundation. And our tradition did things like they went to the South Indian Sri Vaishnava tradition from 1500 years prior and they pulled our Sadviti Sharanagata from there, our six-pointed idea of Sharanagati they pulled from a tradition which had existed, you know, thousands of miles away. It was encoded oftentimes in Tamil, not even in Sanskrit. And they, they figured it out, they got down there, and that's where we get so much of our philosophy about bhakti from. They also went and found a verse in the Ramayana, and that's the verse I want to look at today. So this is from the Ramayana. The Ramayana is a super ancient Itihasa text. It's an epic text, like the Iliad and the Odyssey, which are the oldest texts that deal with Greek mythology. And so the Mahabharata, which the Gita is a part of, and the Ramayana are this Itihasa, historical literature of ancient India, this epic literature of ancient India that tells the story of great kings and lineages that were also savants and their interactions with the deity. And there's a verse in the Ramayana. Um, which is spoken by Ram to Vibhishan when he's accepting him. And the verse goes like this. Sakrid eva prapano yaha tavas miti yachate tasmai abhayam savada tasmai dadami etat vratamama This is a verse spoken by Ram. Um, spoken by God in our tradition. And the verse says, Etat mamavratam. This is my vow. Tat means that, something which is distant from you, either distant spatially or in time. 
Tatkali, that time. A Tatkali, in this time, right now. And so, A Tat Mama Vratam, this, what, I'm just, what I just said, this is my vow. Mama means my, Vratam means vow. It's actually where you get the word, um, I believe it's where you get the word voto from, which it comes the English word vow, I think comes from the Sanskrit of Vrat. I'd have to look it up in the etymological dictionary to be sure, but I'm about 85% sure, just based on the structure of the, the verbal roots. Um, etat mama vratam. This is my vow. What's my vow? Sakrid eva. If one time, prapana yaha, prapano yaha. If one time a person approaches me, prapana means approach. To seek, to seek out, to approach, to move closer to. Sakrit eva prapana yaha. If one time a person approaches me, tavas miti. Tavasmiti cha yachate. And they also say, yachate means um, um, they speak, they call out, they really, the, the Sanskrit verbal root yach means they beg. They beg and they plead. So it's not just saying. If they really, in a heartfelt way, in a pleading way. If one time they approach me and they say, Tavasmi, Tavasmi ti, the iti on the end is a quotation mark in Sanskrit. So it literally means they say these verbatim words. There's a way to do that in Sanskrit. This is the way to do that. They put quotations around. So they say literally, Tavasmi. Tava means yours. Asmi means I am. And then you, those two words come together and it becomes Tavasmi. The middle A gets elongated. And so it becomes Tavasmi. Say it with me. Tavasmi. 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 All right. So if they say those words, if they approach me one time and in a pleading way, they say those words, I am yours. And these words, Tavasmi, they find mention in the uh, Manavadharma Shastra, which is colloquially, commonly known as the uh, Manu Sanghita. The, the technical name is the Manavadharma Shastra. It's the Dharma Shastra of Manu. Manavadharma Shastra. It's known popularly as the Manu Sanghita. And so this word tavasmi shows up in the Manu Samhita and it's when somebody surrenders to you on a military battlefield and you become obliged to give them shelter and protect them and the rules of um, for prisoners of war kick in. Prior to the Geneva Convention, you know, there's a Geneva Convention because I don't know how much you guys are familiar with modern history, but World War I had mustard gas. World War I had trench warfare. And trench warfare is just kind of brutal. You dig trenches and you poke your head out and shoot the other enemy. It's very, very difficult. You're dug in. It's like trying to get rid of rats to get rid of the enemy. And so one of the ways, one of the brilliant ways they came up with which dealing with trench warfare was they invented mustard gas, which just creeps along the ground and you can fire it at your opponents and it creeps along the ground and then it goes down into their trenches. It sinks down their trenches and kills everybody. And so trench warfare resulted in gas warfare and that became the Geneva Convention and the rules against, the rules of engagement and for how you would treat POWs and such. So there was a similar set of rules in ancient India and one of them was if somebody came to you and said, Tavas me, I'm yours, that meant they were surrendering and you could no longer kill them, you had to give them protection. So it's amazing that our tradition actually chose that language, language which was used in military texts thousands of years ago to communicate some truth they wanted to explain about the nature of bhakti as they were reviving bhakti and mining these ancient Vedic texts. 
Sakradeva Prapano Yaha Tavasmi Ticha Yachate. If a person one time approaches me and sincerely cries out and begs, I am yours, then Abhayam Sarvadatasmai, I will grant them fearlessness always. Sarvada means, Sarvada is usually used like Sarvada, Sarvacha, Sarvata, in all ways, at all times, in all places, it communicates this. Always and in all ways, I will give them fearlessness. Dadami, I will personally give that to them. Dadami is in the first person, singular present tense. I will personally give this to them. What will you give them? Fearlessness. Fearlessness in which circumstances? In every circumstance. That will be given by me to you. Etat mama bratam. That's my vow. So when our tradition was trying to figure out, you know, what's the essence of bhakti? How do we ground our musings about bhakti? And our expositions about bhakti? And our thoughts about bhakti? And the nature of the deity and the intimate love, the romantic love that's possible between the soul and God. As we're trying to give shape to that, and codify it, and create a legacy that the future generations can appreciate the wonderful things we've realized, the wonderful things our tradition has realized that have gotten lost, that we have to bring back into the forefront, that we have to breathe life into. Um, they found this verse. And they quoted it. And this, says, this verse is quoted in the 17th century, early 17th century text of Chaitanya Charitamrita. It's where I first read it. And it's quoted in the Madhya Leela chapter 22, which is a section where bhakti is being defined. And so the Sri Vaishnava tradition is quoted, the Ramayans quoted, the Pancharatra is quoted, and then the definitions of our own tradition, which build on those really strong, venerable foundations, are also quoted. And you get a sense that, wow, these savants, these authors, these poets, these um, exegetes, these mystics, they were deeply immersed in and well versed in and extremely familiar with the ancient texts of our tradition such that they were able to distill them and crystallize them and compile them in a way which built on and honored that tradition and made it more accessible to people. And so there's this, it's kind of like a, it's a real marriage of opposites that you find in a revival tradition and also in our revival tradition. Um, on one hand, you've got this boldness and this willingness to break with conventions and norms and, and challenge the standardized mores which become, societies become entrenched in. And to be revolutionary. And to be bold. And, and oftentimes risk persecution or martyrdom. To, 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 to boldly speak a truth. To speak truth to power. And then on the other hand, you've got this incredible honoring of our past and this and, and this is what I was trying to communicate today um, th this meticulous and miraculous and almost impossible adherence to a multi-thousand year tradition that they were able to fully imbibe and just dance amongst texts written across the entire topography of India as well as the entire time topography of ancient India. And they were able to just, just trace the thread out for you. Such that you're like, oh yeah, of course that's what it's been teaching. Of course that's what it's been teaching the whole time. But if you'd had lifetimes hundreds of lifetimes, thousands of lifetimes, you never would have figured it out on your own. 
and just with this deft touch, with a stylus, not even with a printing press, they were able to piece it all together. And this verse very much represents the essence of bhakti. We cry out, we chant Hare Krishna. It's a beautiful, we just chant the name of Krishna. We don't even ask for anything. There's no ask. Give me this or give me that. We don't do that. We just chant the name of Krishna. It's actually, it's not the Maha Mantra. Technically. We call it the Maha Mantra because we're trying to say it's better than all the other mantras. But technically speaking, it's not a mantra because it doesn't have the dative case and other things that you find in mantras. There's no beach syllable. There's no dative case used. Krishnaya, Vishnave, those are standard indica- indicators of a mantra. But in fact, the Hare Krishna mantra doesn't have that type of um, declension and conjugation in it. It's just crying out the name of Krishna over and over again. And it's very much tavasmi cha yachate. You're saying I am yours again and again. Prabhupada one time when translating Hare Krishna into English said, it's like saying, oh my friend. Oh my friend. Crying out. It's an evocative case. Saptami vibhakti in Sanskrit declension, which is when you're crying out somebody from a long distance. The equivalent of saying... Oh, Manu! This is Manu. Hey, hey, Manu! I'm trying to get his attention. He's walking. Manu! Hey, Manu! Ha, Manu! When you chant Hare Krishna, that's the declension is you're doing that. So if you don't say it like that, the declension itself means you're saying that. Like imagine if you were to say, um, you know, OKD. Like if I was saying, like real quietly, OKD. This is KD, Krishna Das. Say, oh, KD. I'm, I'm, I'm actually butchering the term because O oh means you're crying it out. That's what Hare Krishna is. All the words have that. All the words have that. So you're crying out. You're saying, I'm yours. You're opening your heart. And you just do it one time. Like what we're going to do in just a minute. You do kirtan, you open your heart. And magic happens because you've got an omnipotent, omnibenevolent deity who wants nothing more than to help you along in the path, will help you, will remove all fearlessness. You'll be able to uh, soar on wings like eagles, stand on the shoulders of giants, see further than you could ever see on your own. You'll be blessed, you'll be moved, you'll be transformed, you'll undergo a metamorphosis, and all you've got to do is show up sincerely. One time. And so, uh, what's amazing to me, I mean, the, 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 the Ramayana and the Mahabharata, these texts are very, very voluminous. They're extremely long, and they're just two of hundreds and thousands of texts. And somehow our tradition was able to mine through them all and find that bhakti was the open secret in all of them. And then prove it. In, in what you know reads almost like a legal brief where they're saying present after present after present after present to authenticate and validate the teaching for people who valued this tradition and wanted to be able to see that what they were teaching wasn't something new but in fact it was something that went back right to the beginning so that's it but we're going to do kirtan now so let's let's put some skin in the game Let's actually cry out in kirtan. And then we can see what happens and we can talk about it afterwards. Much in the same vein as what our savants have been doing for as long as time has existed. They have been experimenting with spiritual ideas and then noting down their results for posterity's sake. Thank you very much, Hare Krishna.